He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Please would you be seated.
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time of war, and a time of peace. life, time is really important. 
those of us who really enjoy watching the idiocies of Dad's army will know that being out of step and out of time causes problems, not only for yourself, but for the men and women that you are marching with, makes them look so sloppy. Really important to be on time. And if you're in action, you need to know what the plan is and execute it to the letter. Otherwise, things go wrong. And the writer of Ecclesiastes points out that the whole cycle of life is bound up in time, time that God gives to each one of us. And within that time that he gifts us with, there are times of tears and great joy. There are times to fight and to kill but also, thankfully, times of peace and to heal. Times to plant. Times to gather together stones and then throw them away. And in their life of retirement in East Burkholt, in a rural village, their lovely house surrounded by Peter's fields and others, of course you can't escape the time of the seasons, the times of the year, where everything happens at the right time. And the Bible teaches us, of course, that all time belongs to God, and that what we do with our time, one day we will have to account to him for. But then, whatever time we have, God's love for us never fails. He is with us in the times when we are rejoicing and we might even forget that he's there because things are going well. But even more so, he's in the difficult times when we might wonder where he is and whether he is with us at all and indeed whether he cares at all. But in Jesus, we are shown that God cares very much indeed. And that he's not only with us in the good times, but he is very close and understands the bad, difficult, painful times. Because that's what Jesus experienced on the cross before that when he was betrayed by a friend. So our Lord and Saviour understands all the times of our lives. And not only that, he has conquered death. And so even though we have a coffin here before us today, we gather, as the service will remind us later on, as people with hope, because we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And that body which failed Michael in the end, and the mind which sadly drifted away, has now been restored into the new mind, the one that will be with the Lord forever. And in this way, at this Christmas, when we celebrate first coming of the Son of God, we can comfort us, comfort ourselves, that he's still with us, and he will be in the dark days that will lie ahead, but will continue to sustain us and refresh us and encourage us through our friends, as we will continue to remember Michael and the lovely man that he was. Thanks be to God for his amazing love, which never ends. Amen.
Then said he, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I have got hither, yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which, as he went, he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. Somerset, and he then went on to uh, Haydenbury, where the war was still around, and he remembers the doodle bugs cutting out above the countryside of Hertfordshire. But he didn't see much of his parents. His father, himself a distinguished soldier, was away for most of the war, and his mother was working for the country in somewhat secretive ways in London. So in a sense, he was brought up by those around him who weren't his parents. And I always felt that had a profound effect on him for the rest of his life. When he finished school, he went off to Sandhurst to be an officer and a gentleman. Now, I don't know what you think a gentleman is, but I will give you three characterizations of a gentleman to consider. The first one, they say, is this. A gentleman is somebody who knows how to play the bagpipes, but chooses not to. <laughs> I don't think we can properly attribute that to Michael. The second one is that a gentleman will always use the butter knife when dining alone. I think we're getting quite close, because I think he probably would use the butter knife when dining alone. But the third one, which I perhaps like most of all, and for me is the most accurate, is that a gentleman never knowingly gives offence. And I think Michael had that in spades. After Sandhurst, he went off to serve his king and country, and of course, soon afterwards, his queen and country. A few years ago, he asked me to wear my uniform if I was still serving at his funeral. I left the army two years ago, but I wear my own medals out of respect for him. And I have brought his medals along. And there are four of them, and I will talk a little bit now about his military service through these medals. He first went off to Libya to go and search out 
minefields laid by both the Africa Corps and the British Eighth Army. And I think that must have been quite good fun for a young officer. But he was soon plunged into darker times in Korea. And the first two of his medals are from Korea. The UN Medal and then the British Service Medal. He served in a piece of land called the Hook, which is a well-known salient where the UN and Commonwealth forces were holding off Chinese attacks. It was one of the most viscerally difficult and violent parts of that war. And he did talk a little bit about it. His job as an engineer was to build fortifications, but it was also to lead parties out to put lime on the dead bodies of Chinese soldiers who were the fallen. It was also his job to take the soldiers that he lost from his own command back and down and away. That is true service, and he was there for a full 12 months. And after he left Korea, very shortly afterwards, he found himself in a different theatre of operations, but no less difficult, in Kenya, Kenya, as he would call it. There was a conflict which was local and violent and difficult where atrocities, I'm afraid to say, were carried out on both sides, which must have tested his sense of humanity and service a great deal. And he never really spoke about his time there to any great extent. And I think I can understand why. There then followed a brief interlude where he was serving with the Trucial Oman Scouts in a part of the Middle East which is now the United Arab Emirates on loan service on Camelback which must have been a very interesting and amusing diversion for him. He then met my mother, and while I was on the way, he was sent to the Middle East again, uh, to what is now the Yemen, to Aden, and this is his fourth medal, and on it there's a little clasp because he was mentioned in dispatches for his service there. He was by then a major, and his job was to build a road down from foothills to Aden to encourage uh, trade and prosperity in the country. And recently, I've had the good fortune of being able to get in touch with some of the soldiers who were serving with him through Facebook and through an internet site. And they told me a little bit about him, because of course they're still alive, most of them. And I have five little quotations they gave me about him, which I think tells the story of how he was. The first is that he was an old style officer and gentleman. The second one is he possessed the three F's. He was firm, he was fair, he was friendly. Another said that he took us through thick and thin. Another, and you'll forgive the colourful language, but it's soldier speak, he was a bloody good soldier. And the last one I love. The chap said, despite him giving me the odd custodial sentence, I had enormous affection for him. <laughs> and if you can achieve that, because in those days if your soldiers did something wrong, you could put them in prison for a few days. If you can achieve that sense of affection and respect, then you are a truly fine officer. That was his operational service, and through the rest of his career, as he had done a bit before, he served in staff jobs, mainly in Germany and back here in the United Kingdom, and his last job was as second in command of the Military Corrective Training Centre, a great model for corrective training, where everybody there who had committed various misdemeanours and crimes were being refitted both for civilian life and to be reintegrated back into the army according to the severity of the crime committed. But it was a very positive experience for him, and those were happy times in Colchester. He then, having left the army in the mid-80s, became a retired officer, a civil servant working within the army, both in London and in Colchester, and continued to serve until he retired from being retired. So I think we can safely say he served his king, queen, and country. When he finally retired, he served his community. He stood for and was elected as a district councillor. He served as a parish councillor 
and a church warden. And in a very sort of Vicar of Digby way, he served on the parish footpath subcommittee, I imagine with great proficiency in alacrity. And he served and worked for the Royal British Legion on casework, disadvantaged former soldiers. And he would be very glad today that the Royal British Legion is here with its standard. And thank you for coming. Of course, he served in other ways. He served his marriage and his family. He was a wonderful example of a loyal husband, father and grandfather. He was married for 55 years, more than 55 years. He loved Mary without condition, and I know that that love and loyalty was equally reciprocated. He was, I know, very proud of myself and of Christopher for our professional and our personal achievements. And he was immensely proud of his two fine, gifted grandsons and his beautiful, talented granddaughter. And finally, as we've heard, he served his church and his God unconditionally, traditionally, and with great conviction. And when I finished in a few seconds' time, we will say a prayer, which was a prayer that was always said at his prep school, which was close to him, which neatly encapsulates, I think, his vision and his doctrine and his sense of duty and service. So, farewell, Father. You were a fine officer, father, grandfather, husband, servant of many people and many fine causes. You were a gentleman and a gentle man. Requiescat in pace, Father. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. Amen. During the prayers, when I say, may he rest in peace, please would you respond and rise in glory. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. First, a moment of silence in which each one of us can offer to God our own prayers on this day.
May he rest in peace. Father of all, we pray to thee for those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them thy peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of thy perfect will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. May they rest in peace. And the Lord. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin into the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is that this our brother Michael does, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. The Collect for All Saints Day. O Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, Grant us grace, so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys which thou hast prepared for them that unfailingly love thee. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As Jesus taught his disciples, so we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Go forth, O Christian soul from this world, in the name of God the Father Almighty who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Ghost who was poured forth upon thee. Amen. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother Michael, here departed, we therefore commit his body to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may, may be made like unto his glorious body, according to his mighty working, whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, from henceforth, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Even so, saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us.
in church for a while, listen to Martin playing the organ as the family say goodbye to Michael outside. And then Rev Eric and I and Coco will be escorting Michael to the crematorium. And at that point, Mary will be outside waiting to greet you. The blessing. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.